Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome to today's event. Um, my name is Stephen Young. I'm an Associate Professor of Geography and International Studies here at uh, UW-Madison. Um, I'm also the Faculty Director of IRIS NRC, uh, which is the main sponsor for today's event. So this is the Institute for Regional and International Studies National Resource Center. So we are one of the uh, federally funded um, centers on campus that supports and enhances global awareness and inspires informed thinking about the complexities of our world. Uh, we do that through a variety of events, such as the one today through international film clubs and book clubs as well. Uh, and by providing resources and expertise to uh, K-12 and post-secondary educators, as well as students and the community at large. Thank you also to the uh, Department of Geography, which is uh, the co-sponsor for today's event. Uh, before we get started, Essie Lenchner will be running the tech support today. So if you have any challenges, please use the chat function to contact her. And we will be recording today's event and sharing a link and digital resources in a post-event email. Um, but you'll only show on the recording if your microphone is uh, turned on to speak, which uh, you'll be have an opportunity to do when we get to the Q&A uh, section of today's event. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I want to read out the UW-Madison Land Acknowledgement Statement. So the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Trunk land, a place their nation has called the Job since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Trunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Trunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation and today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Uh, we'll return to that pro probably into the course of today's event, because there's a piece about um, that uh, in, in the project that we're going to talk about today um, that, is, that is very relevant to the land acknowledgement statement. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to introduce our main speaker for today, uh, Gareth Baldricker Franklin. Gareth is a PhD student in geography who specializes in the study of maps, map making, and connections between maps, storytelling, and place-based learning. Throughout his career, he's worked on a variety of projects at this intersection, including the Atlas of the Pacific Northwest, Footsteps of La Crosse, and most recently, Mapping de Job, an indigenous walking tour of UW-Madison's campus. And in 2020-21, uh, uh, sorry, 2021-22, he helped to update and redesign the Global Madison Walking Tour, creating a lot of new maps and graphics and plotting a new route, uh, a new route for the uh, walking tour as well. Um, I'm delighted that he's <clears throat> able to join us this afternoon. And we'll be hearing for, from Gareth in just a moment about uh, his own. Uh, interest and, and um, motivation behind him getting involved in the project we're going to describe to you. Uh, what I want to do first of all though is talk a little bit about um, about how the project came together, um, which is where I'm implicated in this story. Uh, because what we want to do is sort of describe this, this tool and then um, really encourage people to uh, utilize it uh, both in terms of in enhancing your own understanding of, of the city that you live in, whether you are new uh, to, to Madison or whether you're very familiar with this place, uh, and also to consider including it in uh, classrooms that you might be teaching in, whether that's high school classrooms or uh, in community colleges or somewhere else uh, on campus. And that can include taking students, as I have done, uh, on tours around part of the city, but it can also mean uh, doing a, a virtual walking tour of the, the campus and downtown and, and near east side of Madison. So I want to, with Gareth's help, explain uh, how this can be uh, useful to a range of different audiences. So again, I'll start by explaining how it first came about. Um, one of my duties since I joined UW-Madison 12 uh, years ago now has been to teach a large uh, introductory lecture class, International Studies 101. Uh, Introduction to International Studies is the name of the course, and it's a sort of gateway into the International Studies major on campus. It enrolls anywhere from sort of 200 to 400 students at any one time. They're mostly 
um, first year students, and they mostly want to broaden their horizons and learn a little bit more about some of the things that are happening in the world and some of the global challenges that we face, uh, be that poverty and inequality, migration, borders, climate change, these kinds of issues, which is great. Uh, one of my learning goals when I teach that course, though, is to uh, have the students understand that being interested in global affairs does not mean um, that you can uh, ignore what is happening in your own uh, local communities as well. Um, and so in that sense, we, we want to think about the city that we live in as both a product of, of wider social and economic transformations that have taken place in the world and has also played an active and, and somewhat privileged role in, in shaping some of those uh, uh, changes and, and, and the responses to them over time as well. And so, you know, maybe that's an obvious point to the extent that many people would think in terms of, you know, acting uh, local and thinking global and so on. But I wanted to think about how in that course we can move away from a more sort of abstract appeal to that, that sentiment and think about grounding that idea in actual sort of material spaces and sites uh, in the in the city that we live in. Uh, in order to allow students to grasp that more clearly. So seven or eight years ago now, that sparked a conversation with a colleague of mine, uh, Rob Roth, who is also in the geography department. He's a professor of cartography and has expertise in design and geovisualization. And we talked about building something. I don't know if we really knew what we would be building, but something that would draw on the principle of situated learning, meaning that we can get students out of the classroom and have Madison effectively serve as their, their classroom uh, and as a, as, a, as a space that, that they can learn in, but also use some sort of interactive map that would help students think about the interdependencies between Madison and other places. So it would be tell a more extroverted um, history of the city, one that sees Madison as a place produced through its changing connections to, to other places. And those connections being in some cases regional or, or across Wisconsin and sometimes stretching out transnationally uh, around the, the globe as well. So Rob took this chance to, to grad students in his seminar. Um, and in 2015, they constructed this Global Madison uh, website um, that we it was really the sort of alpha version of the project we'll talk about today. Um, and I started then teaching with it um, in International Studies 101. We did a survey around student experiences with this that also became a publication to understand how they interacted with the materials. And over the ensuing sort of five or six years, around 2,000 students did the walking tour. Um, many of them in International Studies 101, but also in a course uh, a, called uh, Intro to the City um, as well. Uh, by 2021, though, the, the website was starting to feel dated. The technology, of course, has, has moved on and uh, it needed a fairly significant facelift. Um, and not just in a sort of the cosmetic sense of touching up a little bit, but really thinking about how it's structured the way we had chosen particular kinds of sites to use in the, in the walking tour. Um, and an additional impetus to do that kind of work was uh, again, this idea that it had always been the plan to, to be able to pass this on to uh, other uh, educators at different levels um, in Madison and, and beyond as well. Um, but of course, the question is always, who's going to do that work? Who has the the uh, the skills uh, and and the, the willingness to, to come on board? And that's a good point to, to bring Gareth back in because... Uh, this new version is really, um, uh, the vast majority of that work was done by Gareth. And so I want you to come in, Gareth, and maybe tell us initially just about your own interest in, in taking up on that project and, and what you hope to achieve that. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. And thanks for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so as Stephen said, I'm Gareth, um, PhD student, and I am by trade a cartographer or map maker which is what I study here at UW-Madison um, and is what I've been doing now for about 10 years um, since, since I was an undergraduate. And one of the earliest kind of motivating factors for me uh, when I was starting to like get involved with Global Madison as a student was I was really interested in this, this mapping project that 
I know is getting used. <laughs> um, and I know that students are actually engaging with um, and is allowing them to see Madison in a new way. And I think that that as, as a map maker was compelling to me because one of the things that maps can do and have, have power with is um, revealing these kind of hidden landscapes and connections and networks that are all around us that we might take for granted. Um, and so I was tasked to update Global Madison and it aligned really well with some of my own research interests in storytelling um, and place and bringing these things together uh, in, in a really nice and integrated way. And so around this time, 2021, I was working, starting to work on my master's thesis. Um, and so this, this update of Global Madison fit really nicely into the things that I was thinking about for that, which were partially how do we have this in-person experience um, and how can we kind of create a comparable experience for someone who cannot do the tour physically, is not in the place. Um, and through that process, I worked on the tour, which I'll, I'll show in a second, updated it, like Stephen said, um, and thought through kind of how to make this an accessible experience um, beyond just use out in the actual city. And to be clear, though, that is kind of like the best use case um, and like what the intention is of the project, because we're trying to encourage this situated learning element. However, you know, through some of my research, kind of rethought how we can also provide this at a distance as well um, so that more people can actually use it. Um, and I would say that, that some of that work is still kind of ongoing, um, but in its current form, Global Madison can be used in situ and also if you are somewhere else. And another thing I wanna say that's really cool about Global Madison is that um, for freshmen who take um, International Studies 101, it's often the first time when they go on this tour that they go east of the capital in Madison. And so if you're familiar with Madison's geography, um, one of the findings from the early study was that like a lot of freshmen don't go past a certain point. Um, and this tour allowed them to see more of the city, which I thought was really, really compelling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should I start showing the tour off at this point? Yo, do you want to put the link in, Gareth? Yeah. And tell us if people want to click on the, the link that's going into the chat right now, that will take you to the map. Uh, all I would say is uh, 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 probably don't click the read text aloud button. Otherwise, you won't be able to hear Gareth. But <laughs> if you want to use that to sort of navigate and press some buttons, Gareth will explain how to, to use this. Yeah, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so it seems like everyone can see this. So what we're looking at now is the homepage for Global Madison. And I actually have two tabs here. One of them kind of simulates what it looks like on a smartphone, because if you're actually out doing the tour, this is what you would see. And this is one of the kind of challenges of designing an experience like this and why I wanted to think through how we can kind of simulate the experience in both modalities. Um, so I'll kind of go back and forth between these two modes, uh, not too rapidly, but just so you get a sense of what it what it actually looks like in most use cases, um, but also what it might look like if you are doing this from a distance. So when you first arrive, you are greeted with a little introduction here with a quote from a kind of a esteemed geographer named Doreen Massey, um, whose thought kind of uh, frames what we are going to be doing on the tour. So another element of this is that uh, we want students to be able to use this regardless of what kind of technology they're working with. Um, so I mean, one limitation is they have to have a smartphone, but we tried to make this like as small and uh, easy on the battery as possible so that you can actually like go through the whole tour. And so that's what this little thing down here is. It's just, it's loading all of the, the data. And once it does, we would go to the map. And so if I show what this looks like here, 
So the way this tour works is there are designated stops. There's eight of them. And the idea is when you reach a certain destination where the stop is, you tap or click on the icon that is associated with it, and you receive some information about that particular place. So the first is this boulder that's on the top of Bascom Hill on the UW campus that has a quote from a previous class uh, that graduated. Um, you also have the option to hear kind of a narrated version of this, um, which is useful if you really uh, prefer an experience where you are super situated in the place. Um, and so we, we leave that as an option for any students who want it. And so you click through series of information and eventually you are prompted with a button to proceed to the next plan more. And this is where the tour kind of starts. That was the first stop. And then we actually see where we're going. So this now there's a line between the original stop and the next stop. If you ever get lost, there is a option to show your location just to make sure. Um, and you also see that there are these little circles uh, that are throughout the map. And so in addition to providing information about designated stops, these circles are basically like landmarks throughout the city. And if you click on them, you get some basic information and some historical photos about those places. So this is kind of like, oh, I see something that I'm curious about. What is it? It might not necessarily be like pertinent to the goal of the tour or like the, the narrative of the tour, but it also is like just kind of broadly situating people in Madison um, and hopefully like prompting additional thought about what you're seeing in the environment. So the next stop is about kind of deconstructing the Wisconsin idea. And this is what Stephen was alluding to when he was talking about the land acknowledgement, because this kind of problematizes the ways in which the relationship between the university and people who were already here, namely indigenous people, um, was very fraught and not this kind of rosy picture that sometimes um, gets painted. Additionally, there are these like maps that are kind of throughout the experience. And maybe I'll switch over here because it'll be a little easier to see. Um, so in addition to the actual tour, there are other maps as well that I created that kind of illuminate the themes that we're talking about. And so each stop has three themes. There's interdependencies between places in Madison and places globally, inequalities between in the same like context. So this, for example, are the land grant parcels that were claimed by UW-Madison through the Morrill Act. Um, and so this kind of, again, starts to deconstruct the Wisconsin idea, which the previous slide kind of introduces. Um, and then alternative. So how can we kind of rethink those relationships? And so this kind of framing is consistent throughout every stop. So you kind of have this consistent um, sort of experience where you're introduced to a broader relationship between Madison and some larger phenomenon or, or process. Think about some of the, the inequalities or potential problems with that, and then kind of think through how that can be rethought. And it kind of it kind of goes like this for seven more stops. Um, yeah, I don't know, Stephen. Did you want to call out some of the specific stops now uh, and our favorites? Yeah, sure. Let's let's both do a a, a favorite stop. Okay, let and, me uh, jump up to yours. Yes, then we can open it up to um to questions. So. Uh, one thing on a more practical note is that the tour, as you can see, it sort of goes up State Street around the Capitol and then down to sort of near East Side. It's about, about two miles total, Gareth, something like that. Yeah, and it takes about two and a half to three hours. So it's kind of long. That's definitely a consideration. Um, and, you know, one potential recommendation is to only do part of it if you don't want to do um, so long of a tour or to uh, th another reason why we wanted to think about kind of um, non-mobile options as well. 
Yeah. And that, and that time it takes to do it is also though partly contingent on when I have my students do it, they have to do an assignment as well. So it takes them a bit longer because they've got to be collecting photographs and taking notes themselves. Um, I like this uh, particular stop. This is a built, this is Das Cronenberg building um, on the Near East side, um, which used to be the, the Badger State Shoe Company uh, in the early 20th uh, century so between sort of 1910 and into the 1930s at the sort of uh, peak of what we'd think of as a sort of Fordist economy this was uh, a part of the uh, much more sort of industrial landscape on the north at, at the near east side of um of, of Madison it employed about 250 uh, workers produced about 2,000 pairs of, of shoes a day um, and was really embedded into those kinds of local and regional um, uh, economic networks at that time. In fact, right next to it is also one of the um, uh, one of the earliest markets uh, that existed in in Madison. Uh, we have a piece, though, also thinking about the kinds of social divisions of labor that existed at that time um, in terms of the inequalities, in terms of the pay gap between um, men and women going back a century and also a kind of a provocation. We'll see that there's lots of questions as well in terms of the um, in terms of the the uh, written material at the bottom here about um, thinking about the, what that means today and 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 where we see change or where we see um, um, some continuities between those uh, um, earlier periods of time. Um, and then if we go to the last uh, image, thinking about uh, or or rather if we go to um, uh, this. Uh, map it's talking about now how you know we no longer see buildings like that as sites where you have the complete sort of production of of, of shoes and in fact that's kind of uh, manufacturing work is now done by these large retailers who have global production networks where this is being done in in predominantly low wage sites across the the world and so to think about those new kinds of production uh, uh, strategies, to think about what that means in terms of uh, a building like Das Kronenberg, which of course now is uh, an apartment uh, building um, for, for service economy, uh, workers primarily in the city and is sort of part of that sort of shift in terms of the landscape towards a service economy uh, along the, the isthmus. And then if we go to the last uh, image, though, to think about the consequences of that in terms of where the kinds, you know, the, the shoes and sneakers that we wear today are being produced and the kinds of working conditions that exist there. And these are some uh, images that I took uh, myself, actually, of when there was um, a factory collapsed in 2013 in Bangladesh that was linked to a lot of these global brands that produce sneakers and, and apparel um that is sold in madison and is sometimes licensed by you know uh, to, to have uw um uh, insignia um when that factory collapsed uh, leading to the deaths of just over 1000 people there were um protests that happened um in madison in particular uh, on our campus with uh, students coming together with labor organizers in bangladesh to push universities in particular to demand that brands sign up for um uh, sign up for a new piece of legislation that would demand better working conditions and independent um, uh, auditing of the conditions in the factories uh, where they were producing their uh, their wares, including through various kinds of, of subcontractors. So it kind of tells that story of how that transformation in the in the social and physical landscape of that part of the Near East side, which we think of as being part of this broader transformation from you know, Fordism to post-Fordism and, and, and from a, you know, and this era of sort of globalization and of deindustrialization in some places and, and rapid industrial growth in other parts of the world kind of roots it in particular spaces. And uh, again, I, I like this image to, to close on because it, it says it's not just a, a sort of intellectual exercise in thinking about, oh yeah, our shoes used to be produced, you know, in many cases here in a, in a more sort of local or regional economy and now they're coming from all different parts of the world what this these images do i think is say and that matters in terms of our political responsibilities as well in, in terms of thinking about how our own everyday practices and the the, the things that we consumed um tires in in consequential ways to the the lives of people who uh, may seem uh, you know very far away but um 
with whom there is a, a, an important interdependency. So I always enjoy teaching this site partly because you know I'm I'm always interested in the sort of uh, economic globalization piece of this. Yeah, and I'll call out the next site. Um, and I think that uh, you brought up some really good points about the way the the role of scale um, in the way that we set up this tour and really trying to like make students think at different scales um, from this like very local to zooming out and then zooming back in um, to re-examine themselves and their own relationship with, with these processes. I think that's one of the, the strengths of this tour. Um, I really like the stop at the Madison Gas and Electric Company. Um, and in the initial version of the tour, the kind of alpha version that Stephen was talking about, if you've ever been to where this is in Madison, you'll notice that there's a, a huge retaining wall surrounding this power plant with smokestacks. And like, it's obviously a power plant from a distance, but it's not really something that you can see up close. And so some feedback that we got from students um, from the initial tour was that they didn't really know what they were looking at or if they were in the right place when they were at this particular stop because it's just a wall, essentially. That's what you can see from the street. Um, and so we thought that that would be an interesting kind of avenue to talk about why there's a wall. And the reason for that partially is uh, because when this was a coal-fired plant up until I think the 70s, there were a lot of, there were protests and political action that prompted mg &E to actually like construct this wall to keep people out so that you can see what was going on inside the plant. Um, and so this kind of very obstructive thing that was preventing people from actually feeling like they were in the right place was like very intentional, um, which is, is fascinating. And so this particular stop starts with information about that and then talks about energy and our relationship to energy in Madison and how that is specifically tied to not only places throughout the world, but also other places throughout the US. So this map basically relates pipelines that are used by MG&E as well as incidents where natural gas, um, there was like a expulsion of gas or some sort of failure in the pipeline. And there's a lot of these. Um, just to kind of relate how, kind of like what Stephen was saying in relation to uh, the global like shoe economy, there is connection between what we see and, and in this case, like how we turn our lights on, where that energy comes from, and people across the United States um, in different conditions and different <clears throat> different places. And so it starts with that. And then it zooms out even further and prompts students to think about uh, the relationship between CO2 con consumption and emissions. So this map shows where emissions from CO2 are being consumed or are being emitted through consumption. So basically like not where stuff is being produced, but where things that are being produced are being bought and sold and used. Um, and so this kind of, shows that like Europe and a lot of um, North America, for example, in the US are bringing in uh, and importing products that are causing uh, CO2 emissions. And then finally, we zoom back in to Wisconsin to think about renewable energy. Um, and there's a map here showing uh, Wisconsin's renewable energy resources, um, showing that there's a lot of like wind energy that is being constructed, um, as well as like hydroelectric and solar energy. So this is kind of the alternatives piece for this. Like we are essentially tied in these, these networks and there are, however, these alternatives that exist. And with that, I th think, was there anything else that you wanted to mention about the tour, Stephen? Um, no, I, I think that that sounds good. I think we should probably open it up to questions. I, I'll just say that I, I really like the map um, with the CO2 emissions. Um, 
one of the reasons being that the, the purpose of this map, what it's really trying to convey, as Gareth is saying, is that notion of it's easy to look at, you know, emissions, and it kind of this ties it back also to the um, to the shoe factory. It's easy to look at, as often happens, we discuss, look at this and say, oh well, China now is is overtaking other parts of the world in terms of emissions. You know, even if that's not true per capita, but in terms of total emissions, so you know, China is the problem here, for example. What this, uh, what the the data in this map is showing is that we shouldn't should we count emissions in terms of the place where those that CO two where the fossil fuel, um, fuel was burned, or should we count it? Should we attribute those CO two emissions to the place where the thing that was built through the burning of those fossil fuels was actually consumed? And when we do that, because and again, this is so it's, if we link that to the story of of sort of the globalization of certain forms of production and manufacturing, then we see that this is still our responsibility in many ways in terms of wealthy countries. Just because we've moved our factories to those parts of the world doesn't mean that we shouldn't be accountable for the emissions uh, if if we're the people who are still benefiting from consuming those things. So it, again, forces people, I think, to sort of rethink um, uh, some of the stories that we hear about CO2 emissions in this more sort of into, through this lens of interdependency and sort of relationality, uh, rather than just thinking about these in terms of static kind of geography of, 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 of where things are happening and thinking instead about connections. But let's uh, let's open it up, Gareth, to, to questions and questions about the, the design, how to use this, about um, the, the sort of pedagogy of all this, whatever people think would be helpful. Um, we're, we're happy to talk through them. So folks were not able to unmute before, but you are able to unmute now. Um, feel free to speak up or raise your hand or add a question into the chat. And maybe while we're waiting for questions, I have a few I could think of. But one is, um, how did you, how did you decide on the landmarks to use? I mean, how did, just opening the Pandora's box of this many places I'm sure you could feature. How did you go about making those decisions? I think, yeah, yeah that's a good question. I so there's two answers to that, and uh, the first is that. I can't speak to the original design, but in the redesign, we kind of walked uh, throughout kind of the Near East side past some of the original stops and kind of thought through and noticed places that we thought could make interesting stops in and of themselves that we had that hadn't been included before. Um, and then a another aspect is that part of the motivation behind the the little circles that were on the map between each stop um, that allow students to kind of tap on if they're curious about something in the landscape was to allow us to include more information about Madison and the history of Madison. Um, but yeah, Stephen, you should definitely talk about the original conception <laughs> and how that translated. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's tricky because there are sort of some very um pragmatic kind of concerns around how far can you get people to walk when we were first talking about this some of some uh, a grad student uh, who who's since graduated but was working at that time had all these ideas for all these sites that would have been no doubt brilliant but he had the students like getting on the bus for 20 minutes to this part of town and going and it was kind of like we it, it, we wanted it to be sort of more contained so it was thinking really about sort of campus to that near east side as being practically probably the most sort of um uh sort of the, the parameters of what we wanted to do and then within that there's that sort of back and forth between what are some important global issues that we can think about that we and we can think about whether there's a way to sort of locate that in this within this landscape and also though at various moments for me and, and when we were sort of we, we were walking around with gareth when we were doing the redesign as well recognizing yourself along the way that there are these things that you've looked at that you've walked past loads of times and never actually stopped and thought about 
what it is, what it, you know, uh, where it came from. So we had it in that sense of sort of a surplus of, you know, we could have added more sites, but, um, it, you know, it, it partly came through that process of like with the um, apartment building of learning a little bit about what this building was and then sort of what it used to be and sort of then connecting that with a, with a sort of broader um, um, sort of global process in terms of sort of questions around economic restructuring. And sometimes along the way, you think you've got something, then you go, oh, it doesn't really quite work, but we sort of really work to try to find places that would be, allow us to kind of at least open up um, a particular kind of story to sort of critically think through that. And just to add to that really quick, um, another consideration in addition to just the landmarks was some of the kind of like vistas or perspectives that you get when looking at the city in certain places. So for example, one of the stops that we added is at the Eastern edge of the Capitol square, where you can kind of look out along East Washington. And one of the things that you can see is that the Capitol and the Capitol square is on like a high point. And so we kind of use that students will, will go to the stop first, learn about some of the, the environmental and, and the environmental justice, uh, aspects of Madison's history and present, especially in relation to things like climate change and in particular flooding and the risk of flooding in certain parts of the city. And then they go and see kind of uh, for themselves firsthand the way in which the city is oriented so that the capital is on the high point and the low point is, is basically the rest of the isthmus. <laughs> I guess I can ask a second question um, while folks are thinking of what they might want to ask you, which is, and you, you have in a sense answered this throughout your talk, but um, I see lots of different uh, directions for lesson plans and different things you can learn using this map, economics, international studies, climate change. I guess I'm curious if you want to say more about the various ways you envision it being used and maybe even open the question up to the teachers in the Zoom room. I'm curious if, if this map rings any bells for you or giving ideas for how you could utilize it for different kinds of lessons. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say briefly in response to that, I see that I, again, this is partly for us also a learning exercise of how it could be useful in different kinds of uh, educational settings. Um, for me, um, it, it is partly a way of, of um, you know, and as Gareth says, like a lot of students, this is that they haven't walked through these areas or really looked at the city in some cases, or in some instances, it's a really familiar kind of landscape to them, but one which you hope will, you can sort of create some cognitive dissonance in terms of how they think about this and, and sort of um, change the way they think about the production of these particular um, spaces. For me, I think that um, that is the important thing to me, I think, is that um, that notion of, you know, if, if you want to, if you're interested in, in global, global issues, um, you know, sometimes you can learn a lot about that by thinking about the, the, the place where you're in right now. And, and, and that means both thinking about how, um, you know, Madison has been shaped in terms of the kinds of social and, and spatial inequalities that mark this city by the changing ways in which Madison is connected to other places regionally and, and, and globally, but thinking about the effects that also Madison's growth as a city over time and, and the sort of its shifting uh, economy has had on other parts of the uh, of, of, of Wisconsin and other parts of the world as well, which includes, you know, even in that initial uh, sort of site that we have on the website of thinking about um, how the Morrill Act in, in the 19th century, you know, 
takes unseeded land, bequeaths this to UW Medicine and other universities and sort of, you know, becomes itself a sort of a, a foundational point for thinking about the inequalities um, uh, within the state and how the, the you know, the growth and um, and um, global sort of success at some level of, of UW Medicine was also built on that kind of um, uh, deep uh, inequality and, uh, and 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 forms of dispossession as well. Even as the story we like to tell is about how Madison has, you know, invented or incubated all kinds of great I ideas and inventions that have, you know, can also help the world, which is also part of the story as well. But bringing to light some of those um, inequalities that are uh, structured into those kinds of interdependencies as well. So that for me is the kind of what I want students to be thinking about, because I will say that part of the purpose of this is that at the end of the tour is that, again, you have, it's, it's, you, you've, you learn some stuff along the way, but you're also cultivating a particular kind of skill, which is a critical and relational reading of, of the landscape that they can apply uh, themselves, that they can sort of take with them and, and, and becomes a, a different way of thinking about the local and the global and, and how they interact. But I think you can also just use it like one site as a way to say, if we're interested in thinking about why are our shoes produced in, you know, um, Bangladesh or in, you know, the Caribbean basin, like what's the story behind that? And, and I think that it is powerful to say, and how is Madison, how are our own lives sort of, uh, implicated in that kind of story and to, to use a site in that way too. I like the part about how we're all part of this process. It's not necessarily happening neutrally outside of ourselves. We're constantly part of it. This is the message I see coming through, which is really, really awesome. Okay, I see a question in the chat from Ben, who says, this looks fantastic. Thanks so much for the introduction to a great resource. Apologies if this has already been addressed, but I'm curious about the difference between relative, difference between slash relative merits of a walking tour versus sort of database of rich connection points from both a design and pedagogical perspective. Does that make sense? Like how much does it matter that students engage with this as an integrated sequence versus interesting locations with interesting histories? It's a really good question. And that's actually the question that I, I thought, or a question that I thought about in my thesis. Um, and I think that, I, yeah, there's a lot of different ways that I can answer that. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, the integrated sequence is can be seen as sort of this like curated narrative through the city. Um, and I think that from that perspective, it, like Stephen has said, and like I've said, you know, it's this good introduction in addition to all of the pedagogical benefit to what it's like to live in a place. This is like one story about Madison. Um, I think though, additionally, you could easily take an individual point and that has its own story as well. Um, and I think that that in and of itself is, is part of why I think Global Madison is a valuable resource. The downside though, is that because this is designed specifically kind of for sequence, um, individual stops don't necessarily have as much information as they would if they were their own self-contained kind of thing in, in like a database, for example, or in an atlas. Um, and so the trade-off is like, you know, the walking to can only be so long. <laughs> we don't want students to be walking for like six hours. Um, if we included all the information that we wanted to include, like Stephen was saying, that's a potential risk. And so I think that the walking tour itself is kind of part of, I see it as part of a larger, like an actual database or an atlas of information. Um, and that's partially what I worked on for my thesis and what I'm continue to work on um, past that is to to build this out so that there is more of an an offline thing that I mean that or sorry and 
a desktop experience, not necessarily out in the place, um, but an experience that has all these individual points um, that have with much richer detail about what they are, and how they came to be and the relationship between um, Madison and global processes at these particular places. Um, so just to, to summarize what I'm saying here, like I think pedagogically, the, the integrated tour, the narrative is useful as an introduction to the topic. And potentially, you know, if students are first, this is their like one of their first experiences in Madison itself. Um, but I do think that the idea of an integrated network or database or atlas, whatever you want to call it, um, is a use is useful for like further inquiry. Um, I could certainly see like using the the sequence um, and then you know constructing a a lesson about one of the individual points um, or even having students do that, right? Um, yeah, and so that that's that's my kind of long and short answer. Uh, do you have anything to add, Stephen? No, I feel like you're the expert on that front. I mean, I, I would just say that I think there are merits to to both, you know, thinking about, the, you know, I, I could do this as a sort of like this week, we're talking about climate change. Let's look at this site as a sort of entry point in, in as a way to sort of think about that. Um, and then next week, when we talk about, um, you know, economic globalization, we'll do the Badger State Shoe Factory and do them as a sort of different sites and dig a little deeper e even into those sites. I think that the way that I use it is more because I want the students to be out walking because I want them to be taking note, as you say, Gareth, of some of the places that aren't uh, on th that we haven't directed them to, but are still relevant as potential sites through which to ask a similar set of um uh, uh, questions and to to do the, you know apply that that skill and, and do a little of their own uh, uh, research. So I think that that's when the the tour itself as a as a whole experience can be more uh, beneficial. Great question. <laughs> And I should just say, I can see that Essie has dropped into the chat as well. The link to there's a, a group of uh, people who are doing the walking tour this Friday at 4.30. So it will obviously start at the first site, which is, um, as Gareth introduced, at the top of, top of Bascom Hill. Um, and if you want to do some or all of the walking tour with a group of people, and reduce your chance of getting lost, which a minimal anyway, I'll say. I, like I say, I've sent thousands of students out there who've all come back so um uh, but if you want to do it with a group uh please do click on that link and uh feel free to register for that event any other questions or feedback One thing I can say really quick is if you are someone who is not in Madison or, um, I don't know, is not near the Isthmus, um, obviously, let us know if you want to use this resource. We can, we're happy to provide information on how to do that. Um, I also encourage you to reach out to me if you're interested in developing your own kind of resource like this for wherever you live and work, teach, um, because that is an ongoing interest of mine is to kind of develop a toolkit for creating uh, global medicines uh, for wherever you are. So I wanna just throw that out there if there's any interest, I'll put my, my email in the chat for folks. That's great. Thank you, Gareth. And indeed, that was, you know, part of the also the idea when we we started this whole process and when we we rethought about it, it's um is to think about having more people creating content um and including in their own um local landscapes as well to to sort of extend that kind of principle of of um how to think in those kinds of ways. Okay, another question in the chat from Drew. 
This would be super easy for students to use in the classroom, and I can imagine how I could integrate this into my lessons on industrialization and globalization, uh, among other topics. I'm wondering, however, what students would miss by just doing this virtually. Is there any special value in doing this tour in person? Great question. I mean, the short answer is, invariably, there are things that you will not receive if you don't do the tour in person. Um, and this is what Stephen was talking about in relation to just like learning how to read the landscape. Um, like that that part of it, you know, kind of necessitates an in-person component. However, I think a lot of the information and um, some of the broader picture topics that are covered could easily be integrated into a classroom setting. And again, like we were just saying, I think that like, you know, this could be certainly an avenue for students to, to learn how to read the landscape in their own environment, um, you know, wherever they are, if that is not in Madison or, or if like doing the in-person part of the tour is infeasible for whatever reason. Um, so I think that like you do miss out on uh, something by not doing the, the tour in person. However, I think that like the tour can still serve as a, a kind of um, a springboard to actually uh, learning some of the tools and processes that, you know, the tour covers and that you get from doing it in person. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I would just add that we would be really interested to hear and you can email Gareth or, or me via Iris NRC or, or whatever, but we would love to hear from anybody who's using this about about that experience of using it in a classroom without doing the walking tour, or if the, if students do the, the walking uh, part of it, uh, also how that goes to think about this at different educational um, uh, levels as well, and to think about how we can uh, improve or tweak or add to what we have there right now to make it more useful to, um, to more, um, uh, more groups of people basically because that is the the idea is to move this out of just uh, uh the classrooms that it's been used in so far and, and and think about something that can be sort of adapted for a variety of different learning goals and a, a variety of different um student populations so yeah and we're happy to help with that to reiterate also <laughs> like uh yeah whatever if there's something that you're you're interested in including we can can certainly talk about that Well, if there are no more questions, oh, is there a question? I have one more really quick question. Gareth, I was just wondering, have you shared this with other cities yet? Have you like, I know you want other people, but have you shared it with other places or, or universities even? Because I want to do more. I want to do this one and then I want to do more. So, so I mean, yes and no. It's been shared through like very academic means <laughs> like there's like a, a publication about it like an article that came out in like 2015 but i think that that's something that there's opportunity for is is actual sharing i don't know if you've shared it at all steven i've shared it at like conferences and stuff but in terms of like actual like local networks it is not it it certainly could use some um i don't know some marketing <laughs> maybe <laughs> Yeah, I shared it at a um, economic geography conference, and everybody wanted to create their own. Um, but I think that that's why you know we have talked about doing another event that will be more uh, tilted towards the sort of like tech development side of this, so that um, you know we can provide that kind of um, expertise. To be clear, this is Gareth's expertise, so that other places can do it. So um, yeah, I think that would be another next step in the process. Yeah, and if you know people who are interested, let us know. <laughs> well, we are at time. Yeah, oh, five o'clock is almost upon us. Um, thank you, first and foremost, to Gareth for uh, lending us his his time and his his thoughts and expertise today. Thank you so much, Gareth. This is where we do this bit, either with our hands or through the use of icons. But thank you so much. Uh, for, for sharing your ideas about this. And thank you to everybody uh, who attended today. Um, 
and and share their own thoughts or ask questions. Um, and please do stay in touch. We'll see some of you on the walking tour on Friday. And uh, otherwise, uh, do get in touch if you have any ideas uh, or feedback on on the tool itself. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>